Well, good evening. Uh, thankful to be able to connect with uh, members of True North Baptist Church and uh, any guests that are tuning in tonight. I uh, trust that you've all had a good week, uh, that you're enjoying a close walk with the Lord, and that your heart is prepared and ready to receive God's Word as we open His Word and study together. Uh, today, um, we're continuing our series entitled uh, One Another. And I've emphasized over the past several weeks that the one another commands in the New Testament are all primarily in the context of local church membership. And as a result, God's enablement to be successful in these areas is largely dependent on the obedience of his people to join themselves to the membership of a local church body. And then, of course, to function within that body in the way that God directs in his word. Um, while the, the primary context of these commands leads us to understand the blessing that it is to function in proper relationships with one another in a church body, uh, much the same can be said for homes, can be said for friendships, for workplaces as well. Uh, the same principles will apply. And, and so far we've studied the Bible's statements in a local church membership that we are members one of another from Romans chapter 12, and last week we saw the command to love one another. And those are some of the foundational statements that we begin with and then we're going to just continue to add layers on top of that. Our text today is found in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. And we're only going to read one verse tonight, but uh, we'll see that this verse is absolutely packed full of truth. And I promise that if you have ears to hear, it'll be a great blessing to your life to walk through this study just like it has been to mine. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Our topic for today is admonishing one another. And I want to begin with prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for this wonderful verse. I thank you for the privilege and the responsibility that we have of admonishing and of being admonished. Please teach us today how your churches are supposed to function in this way, uh, teach us how we ought to relate to one another if we're going to be pleasing to you and if we're going to be a rightly functioning part of our church. Open your truth to us today. I pray that you'll let us intently focus on you without distraction through this study, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, maybe this week uh, you've admonished someone. Uh, maybe you've been admonished by someone yourself. Uh, admonishment is a warning. Uh, it is to reprove, it is to exhort someone, and frankly, we've worked very hard to develop an atmosphere at True North Baptist Church that encourages admonishment uh, because it is just a, an essential part of discipleship. It's an essential part of mentoring, and I hope that by the end of our study today, you will have developed a deeper appreciation for what that's all about. Uh, now, uh, people don't like admonishment much these days in our society. Nearly everywhere you look, people that tend to have uh, this cavalier spirit that just says, get your hands off me, uh, don't tell me what I should or what I shouldn't do. And even, even if that isn't stated outrightly, there tends to just be a rebellious cowboy type of attitude that pridefully shrinks away from any type of admonishment and gets offended if admonishment is given. Uh, whether uh, it, it is concern from an authority figure such as a pastor or a parent or whether it's concern just from a concerned peer, uh, our flesh doesn't naturally appreciate or receive admonishment. Today in our culture we have players on sports teams who scream back at the coach or the referee who's offering admonishment to them. We have students that spitefully get into teachers and principals faces rather than receiving admonishment. We have children all throughout our culture who insolently rebel against parental guidance, and we have church members who refuse to receive correction uh, from their pastors who are watching for their souls uh, and trying to warn them about some destructive path that they're on. Uh, can I tell you something about this? God's people are called upon to submit to authority. And as we walk through this, uh, the course of this series, we're going to see that we're called upon even to submit to one another. And that's very foreign to most people in this boisterous, ungodly society. Even when we don't like the call because it ruffles our pride, 
We are to submit to authority and we are to obey, as long as that's in keeping with the Word of God. Um, this spirit towards admonishment that I'm talking about uh, of submitting and obeying isn't found very much in America today. Everybody wants to yell at the referee. Everybody wants to resist the coach. Uh, many want to ignore their parents. Many want to ignore their pastor or their teacher or discipler in a church. Uh, most people, most Christians, have the average American mentality of, I'll do what I want to do. Uh, it's not infrequent for me in my secular job that, that I'll stop somebody for a very egregious speeding violation or some other traffic violation. I stopped a girl recently for driving over a hundred miles per hour on very icy roads and in front of her little daughter she screamed at me, she cursed me out, she blamed me as the cause for her being late and then ripped the ticket out of my hand, peeled out and took off at over a hundred miles per hour again. Um, I want to tell you something today. We all need teaching and we all need admonishment. In fact, uh, most of us wouldn't even be alive without admonishment. You see, uh, teaching, remember the, the statement in Colossians 3.16 is teaching and admonishing one another, and those are the two things that we're considering tonight. But teaching is when we say, hey, um, cars are heavy and cars are fast and cars are dangerous if somebody gets in their path. Well, we teach that to our children. Admonishing is when we say, don't walk out into the street in front of that speeding car. Uh, the, the foundational concept that I want to learn today, or that I want all of us to learn today, is that we all need admonishment and, key thought, mature believers want admonishment. They welcome it. Now, let's get the context of our scripture. Um, from what we can understand, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who's the writer of the book of Colossians, had never been to the city of Colossae. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1 says that many of them had never seen his face in the flesh. Uh, Timothy may have started this church with help from others that Paul had trained, but now, um, as we open this book, Paul is writing to this church from a Roman prison. He had received word that there had been some problems at the church at Colossae. Uh, there had been some Greek philosophy and some heresy that had crept into that church, and Paul was writing specifically to correct them in those particular issues. And then he says to the members of that church, <clears throat> now you need to admonish one another because the church body must be a place where those issues can be dealt with in the future as admonishment is given and received. Uh, you see the spirit of what Paul was saying continued in chapter 3 of Colossians in verse 1. He, he tells them, seek those things which are above. Uh, not sensual things, uh, Greek mythology and so forth. He tells them in verse 5 to abstain from earthly and sensual lusts. He tells them in verse 10 to put off the old man and to put on the new man. He tells them in verse 11 to respect one another. Uh, they weren't to have prejudices against those of other races or other backgrounds within the church body. He tells them in verses 13 and 14 to forbear one another and forgive one another, and to love one another. Then we come to verse 16, which is our text tonight, where he tells them to admonish one another. And he's reminding them that if their church is going to work the way that, uh, that God intends, and if really, really it's just going to work at all, that they're going to have to keep one another in check. That is a key function of members within a church. They're going to have to warn each other sometimes. They're going to have to be willing to receive that warning when it's given. Now, um, I want to get very practical in our study and ask, how does this really work? How can we be effective in giving and in receiving admonishment? Well, let's look at our text. Once again, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I'll have three main points to my study uh, that we'll have together. But the first point that I want to make from the beginning of that verse is that there is, a, I want to talk about the message of admonition, all right? In order to accomplish this and have a church function and thrive how God intends, we must have the word of Christ in us, period. And then we must bring a message of admonition to one another. What can we say about the message of admonition that we carry? Well, uh, if it is what the scriptures are teaching us here, if it is the word of Christ, 
then we can say that it is a sure word of admonition. It is a sure message. It is absolute truth, and it is powerful. If you don't believe that, um, then, uh, then you probably haven't experienced it for yourself. But when we bring a message of admonition, it ought to be the word of Christ. It ought to be sure and steadfast. It's not our opinion. It's the word of Christ himself. That phrase, the word of Christ, refers to the revelation that he brought into this world. Uh, the Bible specifically. And so when it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Paul is saying to us that the basis of our admonishment within a church body and the success of our admonishment is directly related to the eternally true word of God. Uh, Jesus prayed to the Father during his earthly ministry for his church leaders in John chapter 17 and verse 17. Very similar type of statement. He says this, sanctify them, praying to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How were the leaders of Jesus' church going to be uh, sanctified or made holy? It was going to be through his truth, through his word of truth. Psalms tells us that every word of God is pure. Uh, Jesus also said these words, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, if we're going to be effective in teaching and admonishing one another within the Lord's church, uh, it's critical that we are diligent students of every one of his words. We don't pick and choose what we like um, as admonishers. And we don't pick and choose what we like when we are those who are being admonished. Uh, Timothy tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I truly believe that God has preserved his word for us in the King James Version of the Bible. I'm very thankful for a trustworthy translation that comes from a great text, and it's not influenced by Catholic doctrine and man's thoughts. Uh, when, when we open the Bible and we admonish somebody with it, or when it's opened to us and we're admonished with it, we can, be, uh, we can know that it is God's sure, trustworthy word. So as we talk about the message of admonishment that we will bring to others or that someone may bring to us, we understand that it is the word of Christ and the word of Christ is a sure word. We also understand that this word must be settled in our hearts. You notice what it says further in verse 16 of our text there, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let it dwell in you. God's word is to be constantly dwelling in us. Uh, it is to be at home in us. It's to take up residence there and not ever leave. That means that the Bible uh, is not just merely a passing thought for us. It shouldn't just be a Sunday or a Wednesday night thought. Before you can ever function as God wants you to in a church body, before you can ever give good adm admonishment and good advice, the Word of God must be a part of you. It must permeate your life. George Mueller, the famous British preacher and founder of a Great Orphanage in Bristol, England, said this, the vigor of our spiritual lives will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our lives and in our thoughts. Jesus stated this in John chapter 15 and verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. In other words, uh, we're not going to be in sync with even what to ask God in prayer if his word isn't dwelling in us. Psalm 1 and verse 2 says of the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. This concept of meditation, of course, has been perverted by many false religions. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with meditation if it's done in the right way. The problem with uh, yoga and its meditation and many of the Eastern religions and the way that they have taken meditation and tried to apply it is the, what's wrong with it is the object of the meditation in those practices. God commands us to meditate on his word. Now, we are to search the scriptures daily to see whether the things that you're being taught and admonished are so. You should take a message like this and you should go back over it tomorrow. You should evaluate it in light of the scriptures. You should read and study the Word of God. God wants His Word to dwell in you. It should be an intrinsic part of your life every moment of every day. Now, as we prayerfully expose ourselves to the Scriptures, we begin to understand what God's will is regarding our conduct and regarding our character. And then as the Holy Spirit applies His Word to specific areas of our lives, 
And as we're obedient to those promptings, um, we begin to develop Bible-based convictions. That's what will happen is God's, uh, God's people allow his word to abide in them or to dwell in them. Uh, we're talking about the message of admonition that we bring or that we may receive. It is the word of Christ. We understand that it's a sure word. We understand that it must be settled in our hearts. We also understand that it must dwell in us richly. The, uh, the scripture that we're studying tonight goes on to say this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, the word richly means extravagantly. It means there's so much of it in you that it can't help but uh, come out in the way that you live. It can't help but come out in the way that you speak. When you give counsel uh, to someone else or when you give admonition, it should never be, I think. It should always be, the Bible says. God's word says this. Uh, personally, I love listening to the counsel of people who speak from a purely biblical precedent. I love to hear counsel when it's attached to a Bible verse. I don't want to hear some kind of humanistic reasoning. If it's Bible counsel, it helps me. God's word should dwell in us to such an extent that it just flows out of us. Uh, the word richly, once again, it means extravagantly. Have you ever been around somebody that wears an amazing amount of perfume or cologne? Um, maybe some other type of fragrance. There's been a few times that I was sitting in a church service and all of a sudden my eyes started burning and this incredibly strong fragrance started to waft through the air. And as I looked around, I realized that one of the ladies had gotten uh, out some of this oil. I'm not sure exactly what it was and they dabbed some of it on just a little bit, but it's powerful. Uh, no one in the building could possibly miss it. And, and that's the, the thought process that's being conveyed to us. When, when God says that he wants his word to dwell in us richly, it should be extravagantly, it should be such a fragrance that everybody uh, around us uh, can't miss it. It should be emanating from every part of our being. Now, how's that going to happen? How can it dwell in us richly? How can we take it from, uh, from just being people who appreciate God's word on Sundays and maybe Wednesday nights to letting it dwell in us richly? Well, uh, let me give you a few very practical, quick practical thoughts on that, but they're very important. You need to learn how to hear the word. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 9 and in many other places, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. I wish it weren't the case, but I've unfortunately found that oftentimes people assemble in the church and they're checking fantasy football scores on their phones. They're thinking about what time they have to get their food in the oven so it'll be ready for lunch. They're looking dreamily out the windows and their imagination is drifting off to something that they can't wait to be doing. They have everything in their minds except for reverently hearing the powerful word of God as it's being preached and delivered. If it's going to dwell in you, you have to hear it. You have to intentionally hear it and set aside other distractions. You also need to properly handle the word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, Study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now listen, um, a, a church organization is not the fount of all wisdom. The Word of God is the fount of all wisdom. Uh, one of the distinctives that we believe as Baptists is that every person can study the Bible. Every person can understand the Bible. Every person can grow in biblical wisdom. So how do we uh, keep the Word of God or allow it to dwell in us richly? Well, we need to learn how to hear the Word. We need to properly handle the Word, rightly dividing it. We need also to hide God's Word in our hearts, in Psalm 119 and verse 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You have to familiarize with it. You have to commit it to your mind if it's going to be a help to you. And then you need to hold it fast. And you need to hold it forth. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13, we're commanded to hold fast the form of sound words. That's talking about the Bible. We'll get back into our study in Hebrews on Sunday morning this week, and we're going to continue the theme of faithfully holding to the truth of the Bible and not turning back on it. You don't compromise, you don't slip, you don't walk back on the truth that God has revealed to you. As you hold it fast, 
and you hold forth the word of life as Philippians 2.16 commands, then people all around you are going to start to ask questions. You're going to get into discussions. That's going to force you to study it more and develop real convictions that are rooted only in what the word of God says. And so, uh, so we're talking about the word of God, um, that this is the message of admonition that we bring. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then he says, in all wisdom. The word must dwell in us in all wisdom. Now, wisdom is using the knowledge or the truth of God's word in a right way. The word is dwelling in us so that we can take the knowledge we have from the Bible and we can use it with wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13 speaks about this. It says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And he goes on in verse 16 and says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now think about that statement for just a minute. We have the mind of Christ. Where does that mind come from? It comes from the Word of God. Well, let me ask you this. Are you living according to the mind of Christ? Do you admonish your friends according to the word of Christ, or do you encourage them to live in the world? Do you laugh, or do you like, or do you encourage when someone's living a worldly lifestyle? Uh, I'm speaking primarily to members of True North Baptist Church. Do you uh, laugh, or, or like, or encourage uh, when someone is sporting a worldly and sensual look? or they're speaking in a worldly way, or they're thinking in a worldly fashion? Or do you have so much Bible dwelling in you that you know how to keep yourself separated from worldliness that's seeking to destroy your soul? And do you admonish someone who's going astray? I want you to think about how serious this is. The only way that we can accomplish the work that God has put us in this church for is if people stand for the truth. That's it. Lovingly um, go to those who are in sin and admonish them. That's how critical this truth is. Uh, that's not the work, by the way, of a select few in the Lord's body while the rest play shallow spiritual games for years on end. You know, we can't do that work that God has commanded us to do as a church unless the word is dwelling in us richly in all wisdom. Uh, let me be real honest here. I don't care about your gut feeling. I don't care about your opinion. I don't care what your daddy thought. I don't care what your mama said. What people desperately need to know is what does God say on the matter? The first part of our text speaks about the message of admonition that we bring. Secondly, let's talk about the ministry of admonition. All of us, all of us are in the ministry of teaching and admonishing. Uh, once our hearts are filling with the Word of God and it's dwelling in us richly, we can begin the real ministry that God has for His church members. What can we say about it? Well, it's a ministry of teaching, obviously. That's the first of the two things he mentions. Teaching and admonishing. Uh, to teach is simply to impart instruction to another. It may be slightly different, of course, in its presentation if you're teaching a three-year-old or if you're teaching a 16-year-old or if you're teaching an adult, but it's always the same truth. We teach the truth and we impart the instruction of God's word. Once again, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that, that word inspiration means that the Bible is, uh, it is a God-breathed supernatural book. It's not just Shakespearean poetry. It is the eternal, infallible word of God. That verse goes on to say that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For those um, who may be uh, trying to jot down notes or, or keep this laid out in a succinct way, I'll give you the definition of those terms. Doctrine that the Word of God is profitable for. Doctrine refers to truth. It refers to what's right. And we have a doctrinal statement at True North Baptist Church. That doctrinal statement clearly spells out the doctrines that we believe about Jesus Christ, the doctrines we believe about the salvation that he provides us, 
doctrines concerning sin and heaven and hell and baptism and church government and the Lord's Supper and proper relationships in the home and proper relationships in the church and, and etc. There's a lot more that our doctrinal statement covers. These things are right and they're true. They come straight from the pages of Scripture. And so doctrine refers to what is right. Reproof. The Bible is profitable for doctrine for reproof. Reproof refers to what's wrong. When somebody is living wrong, the Bible reproves them. When somebody is living wrong, it's our responsibility as God's people to share the truth of the Bible with them in a loving way. And then correction teaches us how to get the wrong right. The Bible clearly shows us that. The Bible shows you when you're in a wrong relationship, and it shows you how to get it right. The Bible shows you when you're wrong in a belief and how to get it right. The Bible shows you when you're wrong in your spirit and how to get it right. And then he says that the Bible is profitable for instruction in righteousness. And instruction shows us how to stay on the right path once we've been corrected. Now, teaching imparts instruction. And it instills doctrine into the life of a believer. Now, you know, the Bible says of the Jerusalem church members in Acts chapter 2 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, folks, uh, we need to be taught Bible doctrines so that we know what to believe. Our major emphasis the past two years at our church, being a fairly young and new church, has, um, has been to develop and grow and build leaders and firmly establish them in maturity and in doctrine. And that should always remain a focus for us. But I think that we might be concerned at how few people that are called Christians actually know enough Bible to even be able to lead somebody else to Jesus Christ or to biblically be able to show somebody how to forgive, or to show somebody what the Lord's church really is and how it should function. Folks, uh, we are here as part of a church to get some teaching to live our lives by, not just to have a social club. And as we talk about um, this ministry, uh, we can say that it's first a ministry of teaching, but then, of course, it's a ministry of admonition. And this is the theme of our study today, teaching and admonishing one another is the command. I told you in the introduction that to admonish is to reprove. It is to caution someone. It's to give a warning. I heard a quote this week that said this, that a good leader can step on your toes without messing up the shine. Uh, it's not always easy, and yet it's so necessary in leadership to admonish people whose behavior, whose attitude, whose activities are detrimental to the work of God or to the mission of our church. And so we must admonish. In another place, the Bible says it this way, As iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. That's Proverbs 27, 17. Now some people are so touchy and so easily offended that you can't even say to them something as simple as, I missed you in Sunday school today without them getting offended. Uh, with all the love in my heart, I tell you this, that if you find yourself being that way at all, you've missed the whole spirit of what I'm teaching in this one another series. If that's the case in your life, I want to encourage you that you have some work to do. And you have to change if you're going to be an effective part of the Lord's church. Uh, can I tell you that when somebody loves you enough to admonish you with God's word, that that is a gift to you. You're seeing somebody who really loves you and is trying to help you. God commands us not only to teach the doctrine, but to admonish people when they step outside of that doctrine. And so admonishing is really uh, the negative side of teaching, if we can put it that way. It's the warning. And it must be done in the Lord's churches on a regular basis. And it should be responded to then with a spirit of grace and humility and intimacy between members of the body. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy chapter 4 uh, and verse 2. It says, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Uh, look at the command here. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. The emphasis of Scripture is that we need to be taught, and we need to be admonished from the doctrine of the Word of God. Why? Why? 
Well, Ephesians chapter 4 speaks of the proper function of a church body. And it says that admonition and teaching is critical so that we won't be tossed to and fro. That's a picture of a ship just being driven by the, by the sea, just being driven by the wind and the waves, tossed back and forth out of control. Uh, this teaching and this admonition that keeps a person stable and keeps them from being tossed around in life is a critical part of God's saints being mature. And so when you have a warning given to you from the pulpit of our church, or from me as a pastor, or from a teacher, or from a friend. Whether that warning is about your personal life, in the wrong direction you may be going there, whether uh, the warning may be about your family life, or whether the warning may be about the way that you're functioning in church ministry, whatever the topic may be, you would be very wise to hear the admonishment of a loving pastor or of a loving friend. Appreciate the truth that they're bringing you if it's from the Word of God. Don't have the destructive uh, Burger King attitude of the day, which is, I'll have it my way. Uh, God tells us that's not how it works in His churches. All the world may do it that way, but it shall not be so among you, Jesus said. Back in 1986, there were two electrical engineers at the control center of a nuclear power plant in a place that's known as Chernobyl, uh, it's a city in Ukraine. These two engineers decided that they'd try an experiment. Their experiment was to play around with the nuclear reactor. That should have been their first warning sign. Well, they wanted to see how long the turbines could free will when they cut power to the facility, and so they turned the motors off, and they observed the freewheeling spin of the turbines, uh, when they powered down the motors, there were warnings that started to come on because the motors were responsible for pushing coolant through the reactor to keep it from overheating. In fact, six different warnings came on. Six times they were told to re-engage the power to the motors, and six times they overrode the warning until finally the greatest nuclear disaster in the history of our planet took place because two engineers wouldn't heed the warnings about impending disaster. Now, I ask you to, uh, tonight, how many times, young and old men, have you sat under the preaching and teaching of God's Word? That's given warnings, maybe about alcohol or pornography or wrong relationships or lust or anger or any other number of topics and have received admonition to walk in holiness and to be leaders and to dedicate your lives as a living sacrifice to God and serve Him alone? How many times... Have women heard the word of God against gossip or against bitterness or against rebellion? They've heard the admonition of God's word about modesty or soberness or grace or kindness or virtue. How many times has admonition been given that wasn't heeded? And six times somebody put it on over, uh, override and said, that's not for me. I don't have to listen to what he says. Or they listen, but they don't follow through and make application of it. And now, sadly, children are damaged and marriages are devastated and testimonies are destroyed and the cause of Christ has suffered irreparable harm. Why? Well, because of people who will not hear admonishment. Friends, uh, don't let your life be some kind of nuclear waste. Don't melt down because you were too proud to receive and apply admonishment. Many people today may like to go to a church where they just feel good all the time. There's plenty of those around. That's what was being referenced when it talked in 1 Timothy 4 about uh, the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. They're going to heap teachers to themselves that will just tickle their ears and make them feel good about themselves. They'll turn to fables. We see that all around us today. And most people like to go to those kind of churches where they're just going to feel good all the time. But the Bible is like a sword. It's like a surgeon's scalpel, incredibly sharp. And it's wielded to save a life. Uh, personally, I want to be cut and broken down in that way. I need that. I desperately need it. The mature believer, as I mentioned earlier, will welcome and cultivate this type of heart towards God's Word and towards one another within a church membership. The verse that we're studying starts with a very simple but challenging word, and that's the word, let. We've got to let God do this work in us. 
We've got to let caring believers in our church do this work in us. We've got to open our hearts, banish pride, and say, I needed that. Thanks for caring enough for me to preach that. Or, or thanks for caring enough to talk to me about that. That should be seen in our, in our church. It should be seen in our homes also. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 references this work in the home, and it says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, in our day, the norm is that the children run the home, and they manipulate the parents. Parents frequently aren't willing to put in the hard work of teaching and training and admonishing from God's Word so that they establish values and convictions in their children. And their children tend to be utter failures as a result. They wear, the, they wear what they want to wear. They go where they want to go. They decide what type of friends appeal to them. They go to the schools that appeal to their flesh. They have no respect for anything that represents authority. Our, our culture is permeated with that type of thought from children. Now, you can leave your children up to society, and you'll be devastated with the result. But God says this, bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. There's that word again. From the word of God, as parents, you set the standard. Uh, son, uh, we don't watch that. Son, we don't say that. Uh, son, we don't participate in that. Son, you can't be around those kinds of people. Son, you dedicate your heart to serving God. Uh, fathers need to say to their daughters, uh, sweetheart, it doesn't matter what the other girls wear. You can't wear that type of clothing because it's immodest, and God has designed you to protect yourself from the lustful eyes of men. Uh, sweetheart, we're not going to watch that. Uh, that's not going to come into our home. Um, uh, you, uh, uh, we, we could go on and on, but you, you can't have those kinds of friends um, and etc. Uh, so what are you doing when, as a parent, you make those types of statements? Uh, they should be biblically based. They should be based on sound principle. Uh, but you're admonishing, you're warning, you're trying to give understanding and perspective. If you love your children, you'll admonish and guide them. You'll bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you love your church... You'll participate as a member in this ministry of admonishment. Admonishment is a key part of biblical, healthy relationships. It isn't mean, by the way. And it doesn't have a holier-than-thou type of spirit. But if you love someone, you're not going to stand by and say nothing about it while they destroy themselves. We've got to have enough courage to take God's Word, which is dwelling richly in us, and share it. And so, um, there's a message of admonition. That's the Word of God. It's powerful. It's sure. It's steadfast. It should be dwelling within us. It should be richly dwelling within us and bring tremendous wisdom to us so then we can engage in the ministry of admonition. That's when we teach and admonish people that we love with the Word of God. And finally, let's look at the means of admonition. And this is really an interesting and fun part of this study to me. But how do we do it? I've already talked about preaching and teaching and parenting and personal challenge that may be given on a peer level. Note our text again, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's another type of ministry besides preaching and teaching that the church enjoys, and that is the ministry of music. Now, maybe you've never much considered it, but we have the means of music for teaching and for admonishing. Maybe you've always just thought that music is simply between you and the Lord. But here in this scripture, we learn that it is essential to the proper function of a church body. It's essential to the discipline and order of a church body. It's a great teaching tool within a church body. We sing songs uh, with a lot of different messages, of course, in our church. Uh, a song like Rescue the Perishing may admonish us to rescue souls from hell by the power of the gospel message. A song like Blessed Assurance teaches us about the security that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. But the Bible says this, it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. It's a command to us to, to sing um, and to sing praises and thanksgiving to the Lord. At True North Baptist Church, 
Um, there are some principles that we guide our music ministry by, and I don't have time to go into a whole lot of it this evening, but we focus on melody that's discernible, and we focus on lyrics that are doctrinal. It's our desire that our music would have a discernible, orderly, joyous melody to it, and that the lyrics would be biblically sound, conveying the word of Christ very plainly. Now, we have to be very choosy in this area. We have to be very wise in this area because many authors of so-called Christian music are not people who let the word dwell in them richly. And as a result, the lyrics that they write are extremely shallow and the associations and lifestyles that they maintain are ungodly. Now, we want to find scriptural songs to sing together and teach one another with. And this scripture gives us a few really good guidelines. It says that we ought to teach and admonish one another in psalms, first of all. Now, this refers to putting scripture to music. The Hebrew children sang the psalms. The book of Psalms was their songbook. Many of the songs and choruses that we sing have words right out of the book of Psalms. Uh, secondly, we see the word hymns, psalms and hymns. Um, hymns are an expression of praise to God as well. Uh, some of the early churches sang Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 and Philippians 2 6 through 11 and other New Testament scriptures as well. These were hymns that were expressions to God about the wonderful things that he's done for us in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, he speaks about spiritual songs. We ought to teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, of course, the word spiritual is from the Greek word uh, um, uh, pneuma uh, tikos, it simply means of the Spirit. Uh, it is of the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of man. And once again, that is always going to be governed specifically by the Word of God. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a pollster uh, by the name of George Barna who does a lot of studies on church life and, and puts out these surveys on a regular basis. And poll after poll has found that the focus of most church music today is not on proclaiming truth about God. It's not on proclaiming truth um, to God, but it's focused on personal entertainment. Most Americans who attend church will go merely to satisfy or please themselves, not to honor or please God. In fact, a much larger percentage of Americans claim that they attend worship services for personal benefit uh, or for pleasure even because of the, the worldly type of music and entertainment that's given rather than for the purpose of knowing God through his word. Uh, our worship needs to line up with God and his word always. Many people want to go to a show or to hear a band play and they'll tolerate just a little bit of preaching and there are plenty of organizations in our community and throughout the world that are, that are going to have that type of thing that they offer. But we believe that the central focus of real worship is when the Bible is opened and the Bible is preached. Music in our assembly should always line up with that preaching and it should support that preaching. Uh, doctrinally, there should always be harmony between the preaching and the singing because it all comes from the Word of God if it's done properly. I want you to think for just a minute about this wonderful song that's found in Romans, or excuse me, in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. It says that they, sang, they sung a new song, saying, Worthy art... Uh, let me start that over. Revelation 5, 9. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tribe and people and nation, and hast made us uh, unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Uh, there's some teaching and doctrine in that song. That's a heavenly song that will be sung. They were singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. Years ago, uh, most Protestant denominations began to systematically remove all the songs that had the word blood from their hymnals. And they said, uh, we don't want a bloody religion. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I want a bloody religion uh, in this sense. I thank God for the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And even in heaven, the angels and the saints are singing, praise God for the blood that was shed. And so music can teach us and it can admonish us. It should be a primary means 
through which our hearts connect and unite with one another and unite around the words of God that we're singing. When we sing at church, let's remember that we sing together, we sing with, and we sing to one another. Now, we don't sing for our own glory or for our own aggrandizement. We're not trying to draw attention to the flesh, and we're not trying to be silly about this. But there is specific biblical message that's being conveyed in that that can be a tremendous means of teaching biblical truth. Remember that music is to be given in a particular way, and we notice this as we close. Singing, it says, with grace in your heart. Singing with grace in your heart. Grace is the undeserved gift of God. It should cause us to sing with joy. It should cause us to sing with feeling. It should cause us to sing sometimes with tears and with reflection on what God has done. It should bring joy to hearts. But in all of that, it's with a spirit of grace. We notice the last phrase, we sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord as we teach and admonish one another in this way. We learn from one another, we admonish one another in this way, but always remember that it is ultimately to and for the Lord. You may not, you, you may not have the greatest voice, and that's okay because uh, we do our best for the Lord. Some of the greatest singers, in fact, that I've ever known weren't guys or gals who had the greatest talent or the greatest professional voice training. Uh, their hearts just showed that they were singing for the Lord. So the message today is that God's word must dwell in us richly, and as it saturates our lives, we'll love it however it comes. We'll joy to receive it, and we'll be challenged by it in the preaching, and we'll apply it. We will joy to receive it in teaching. We'll joy to receive it if it comes through personal exhortation or whether it comes in the home. We're going to love the word of Christ. We're going to hear it. We're going to apply it. We're going to be changed by it. Uh, there's this special ministry that God calls each one of us to as members of his church body. He wants us to take that ministry of teaching and of admonition very, very seriously. Now, I want to practice what we've studied together and give you one final admonition. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, it says this, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. One day Jesus Christ will appear, and the question is, are you really ready to meet him? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Have you settled that issue the way that the Bible teaches us to? by humbling yourself and repenting before God, recognizing your sin for how terrible it really is. If you haven't, then today I want to admonish you to come before God and fully acknowledge that you'll face the judgment of God for your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ and the payment that he made to save you from hell. If you are already saved, then I admonish you, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Stop playing around and get serious about giving everything to the Lord. Don't be indifferent about somebody who you see, a fellow church member who's going down the wrong path. Don't be ambivalent about that. Their soul is at stake. Don't be afraid to admonish one another. Don't be too proud to receive admonishment. But as a mature believer, cultivate a thankfulness for this special way that we connect with one another. Let's do what God's called us to do in our church body at True North Baptist Church. And let's set a different uh, vision uh, for the world and for the community around us about how this can function. As we end, uh, I want to issue a very personal challenge uh, to True North Baptist Church as we walk through this series right now on Wednesday evenings, uh, this One Another series. And we're learning how to interact with and relate to one another within a church body and right now we're experiencing a very special opportunity to practice some of these very things. Uh, I'm going to ask you to proactively reach out to your fellow church members and to your loved ones and take a message of hope and a message of God's word to people's lives. Stay very closely connected with each other. Don't withdraw. Um, let's, uh, let's be very pleasing to the Lord and allow him to work in and through these circumstances that we're facing in our culture right now to bring honor and glory to him. Let's close in prayer. Father, I give thanks today for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you that your word is powerful, that it's sure. I thank you for the tremendous work 
the unspeakable work that it's done in my life. As I've yielded my heart to you, I thank you for our church. I thank you for the teachings that you give in your word about how we're supposed to interact and interrelate with one another. I pray that you'll find True North Baptist Church to be an assembly of people who have humble hearts, who are eager uh, to receive admonition from your word. Help us to cultivate in each of our lives and in our church body at large an atmosphere that welcomes the admonition of your word through preaching, through teaching, through personal challenge, through, uh, through home devotions, through witnessing. And Lord, through all of those different functions, I pray that your word would permeate every area of our lives and that we wouldn't just cultivate a willingness to, uh, to give and to receive that, but that it would be taken and really applied because if we don't, uh, if we don't intentionally and proactively make application, then it's all for naught. I pray for your care on each of our church members and for our loved ones. I pray for health and I pray for, um, for you to walk very closely with each one of us uh, right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Love you folks. Um, pray that you have a blessed remainder of your week. And I look forward to being able to stay in contact with you through electronic communication. Have a good night.